Hey, I'm Nate Fawson. I'm a professional archaeologist currently excavating in the sweltering heat of northern Texas, and I specialize in the archaeology of North America prior to its colonization by Europeans. This has been my primary field of work and study for over 10 years, especially in the region we call the Eastern Woodlands. Now, today I want to dig a little deeper into what archaeology is really about and one of the best questions ever asked in the history of the science. How do we get the static archaeological record, the things that we dig up, to tell us about a dynamic human past? Now, that's going to take a lot of unpacking. So back in the 1960s, an archaeologist named Lewis Binford, who's arguably the father of modern archaeology, made some important observations. One was that individuals, and therefore groups of people, are thermodynamic systems. A person, a family, a village, and so on, they all require energy to keep functioning. And if an individual or a group is unable to meet its thermodynamic needs, like food, water, and shelter, then that group or individual dies. So the second observation was that a person or group's life is organized around dynamic behaviors catching a fish, butchering an animal, weaving a basket, cooking a meal, so on and so forth. These are all activities that occupy human life. And those activities are most often oriented around satisfying those primary thermodynamic needs, the need for energy. So if enough people share enough of these behaviors in common or network their behaviors in the goal of meeting those ends, then you have a culture, a way of life. So the question then becomes, how do we as archaeologists use the things that people left behind, the artifacts, the tools, the bones, and the fireplaces, and the houses, and all of that, to understand the behaviors of people in the distant past. So this is a lot more complicated than it might seem on the surface. So here's an oversimplified example, but if we excavate a site and we find totally different kinds of stone tools on the east side than we find on the west side of the site, does that mean that the two sides of the site were occupied at different times? Does it mean it was occupied by different cultures, or were the two parts of the site being used by the same group of people for different activities? Maybe one side was an area where a group of guys were making and replacing their hunting equipment, and the other side was where they were working on making baskets or something like that. So the tools in each location look different. How would you be able to tell which scenario you're really observing? Um, another example is, uh, like, what if you're exca excavating a site and you're finding a lot of animal bones? Is it a kill site? Is it a butchering site where game is cut into pieces before being transported back to the main camp or the village? Or are you excavating a base camp itself? Again, how would you know what you're looking at? So this focus on connecting the things we excavate in the present to the actions of people in the past created a much more aggressively scientific archaeology. And scientific theories that connect the archaeological record, the, the stuff, to human behaviors of the past is what Benford called middle-range theory. And this branch of theory was then informed by two new fields of study. So one is called ethnoarchaeology, and this is the practice of observing the behaviors of existing cultures, recording what kinds of sites they create in the present, and then using that information to interpret the material we find on archaeological sites. So it's less like trying to compare apples and oranges and more like trying to figure out as much as you can about what an orange is like by studying limes, grapefruits, mandarins, and tangerines when you've never seen an orange. Uh, as an example of this kind of ethnoarchaeology, um, Lewis Benford went and lived with the Nunamut culture in Alaska and this culture depends pretty heavily on caribou hunting for the bulk of their diet. So he lived with them for a long time. He recorded um, like what they were spending their time doing while they were on hunting trips and what archaeological traces were left behind. And when there was a kill, he documented things like what portions of meat were eaten on site, what portions were taken back to the base camp, and what parts were left behind. And he found that these patterns were mostly related to how far away the base camp was from the kill site, but in general, certain bones associated with large pieces of meat, like uh, the femur in the back legs or the scapula in the shoulder, were the least likely to be left behind because they're associated with high yield pieces of meat, whereas bony parts without much meat, like feet elements, are typically left behind. So this kind of real-world study was, in a lot of ways, what the beginning of—this was the beginning of zooarchaeology as we, as we know it today.
So the other field that kind of informs middle range theory is uh, what we call experimental archaeology. And this practice is effectively looking at some archaeological phenomenon and then designing experiments to try to explain the phenomenon that we're seeing. So, for example, as I talked about in another video, during the Archaic period up around Lake Superior, uh, copper spear points were common for several thousand years, but then during the transition to the Woodland period, they become less and less common until eventually they basically disappear. So some experiments have been done looking at how difficult it is to manufacture stone spears versus copper spears and how effective each is relative to each other to try to explain that transition based on how well these two kinds of artifacts function and how difficult it is to make them. So this focus on cultural change is the primary focus of archaeology. What we're really trying to do is understand how cultures change over time and then develop models that explain why those cultures change, why the change occurs at all. Why did hunter-gatherers start farming? Why did people start building monumental earthworks? What made them stop? What archaeology is really about at its core is to understand these processes that drive cultures to change over long periods of time. It's been about 60 years since these changes in the science of archaeology started, and our models are much more nuanced than they were in the 60s and 70s. But at the root of it, that's still what archaeology is all about, is understanding how cultures change and what's causing those changes to happen. Now, I know this was much more theoretical than I usually get, but I still hope you found all that interesting. If you have any questions, please leave those in the comments. And as always, thank you for watching.